the king of Babylon in prophecy. We're going to find that he's a type of the Antichrist. This is the Antichrist series. We've been working through this series on the Antichrist. We've done several videos. We looked at Revelation 13, the beast of Revelation 13 with the image, the mark of the beast, 666, buying and selling. We've looked at the seventh head of the scarlet beast, which is a type of the Antichrist or a symbol of the Antichrist. Gog, another symbol of the Antichrist. We've looked at that. And the man of sin we've looked at. In this video, we're going to look at the king of Babylon. And we have several more videos that will be coming out in this series. Please consider subscribing to this channel. There's a little red button in the bottom right hand corner. And let's move on in the study. Okay, how to recognize the Antichrist. We compare scripture with scripture. 1 Corinthians 2.13. And when we do that, we find that he's powered by Satan. He will lead the false churches and power churches, also known as Babylon. He's a world leader. He's from the north and the west, from the Gentiles. He, one of the main characteristics is, is his pride, his desire for worship and adulation. And he has a plan to persecute. He's, he lies and deceives. There's sin, lawlessness, idolatry, worldliness, which is the abomination of desolation. In our comment section out of this video, there's many links to these studies we have on our website. When we look at the New Testament, we see prophecy. There's plenty of prophecy all through the Bible. A lot of prophecy in the Old Testament were symbols or types or foreshadows of the prophecy of the end time. So we have the church age. Christ is on the cross. That starts the church age. At the, towards the end of the church age, there's a falling away, which we're already in now. It's called the apostasy. But when the man of sin, the Antichrist, arises and is revealed, that's the great tribulation. It's a little season. It features the abomination of desolation. It features the Antichrist. Babylon is in her heyday with, with deception and spiritual fornication. And then the great tribulation is followed by the last day, the second coming of Christ, rewards for his people and judgment for everybody else which ushers in eternity in the new heavens new earth and new jerusalem okay and babylon is featured in the bible from genesis to revelation it's 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 a major theme of the whole bible we recall that nimrod he began to be a mighty one in the earth he was a mighty hunter before the lord and the beginning of his kingdom his kingdom was Babel. And that word Babel in the Hebrew, we can get confused with that, but it's the identical Hebrew word as Babylon. Identical. It's just another way the translators interpreted it. So from Genesis, Babylon was there. The seventh head of the scarlet beast, which carries Babylon in the end of Revelation, Revelation 17 and 18, that seventh head is symbolic of the Antichrist of the Great Tribulation. Revelation 17, 3, I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And those seven heads, heads represented, they are seven kings. Five were falling. One is, and the other's not yet come. And that other that's not yet come at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation is the Antichrist. Because when he comes, he must continue a short space, that little season of the Great Tribulation. Let's start honing in now on the King of Babylon. The King of Babylon in the Old Testament is highlighted by the Babylonian captivity. The Babylonian captivity, it's a significant volume of discussion on this in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Minor Prophets, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, etc. It's a 70 years prophecy. It happened in the 6th century uh, uh, BC. There was of Jerusalem, Judah surrounded Jerusalem. There was multiple deportations. Israel was already in captivity by Assyria. There's multiple captivities of the people of Judah and Jerusalem. There's a siege and finally a destruction. The first 20 years featured all of that. And then 50 years after that, the land was desolate. The, the, the people of Israel were in captivity. They were scattered. And before the exile begins in 536 BC under Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah. But again, the Babylonian captivity is a large portion of prophecy and it all points 
to the Great Tribulation and the Last Day. The Babylonian captivity also, that 70 year period is a type of the Great Tribulation, that little season, that little season before the end of the world, before the second coming of Christ, that little season of Great Tribulation, the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation, the mark of the beast, etc. We see an important passage, and again, I'd encourage you to look at that series we have on the Babylonian captivity. The first video in that series is actually on this topic, about it being the type of the Great Tribulation. One of the important passages to recognize that is right in the Olivet Discourse in Luke 21, where Christ is talking about the Great Tribulation. Luke 21, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. That's exactly what happened to Judah in that 70 year period of time of the Babylonian captivity. They shall fall by the edge of the sword. Same thing in the Babylonian captivity. They should be led away captive into all nations. Same thing in the, in the Babylonian captivity. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Well, sure enough, Babylon enters into the city of Jerusalem and trodden it down until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. It's, a, it's an identical parallel passage to the Babylonian capti captivity. It's a period of time where Babylon in the Old Testament, it was the, the church of the Old Testament, which was Israel and Judah, they were taken captive. But in the Great Tribulation, Babylon, which is worldliness, it's Satan and his kingdom, will take the church captive. And the church itself becomes Babylon. The, and it features the abomination of desolation, which is a symbol for the worldliness, the desolation of Judah, Jerusalem, due to abominations. Abominations are what makes desolate. And again, in our study on the abomination of desolation, we, we go through that in that study. Okay, so now we want to focus, though, in this study on the king of Babylon. We've done many other studies on the Babylonian captivity, the Great Tribulation, etc. And you can look at those links again in the comments section. But our focus now is we want to be laser focused on this King of Babylon. Because this King of Babylon is a symbol, it's a type of Antichrist. In Isaiah 13 and 14, those two chapters talk about judgment on Babylon. Isaiah 13, the burden of Babylon for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and it shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. When we read that, we might say, well, that sounds an awful lot like the last day, the day of judgment, the day of God's wrath. Because it is, it's just the, the, the destruction of Babylon, the judgment on Babylon at the last, it happens on the last day, it is a symbol for the last day. And that's why the existence of Babylon and the Babylonian captivity symbolized the Great Tribulation. And then when Babylon was destroyed, that symbolized the last day or the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's parallel. There's actually two fulfillments of this Isaiah passage. It's the last day of judgment, which we just discussed. And also, it's actually what happened in the 6th century BC, the defeat of Babylon, Babylon by the Medes, the kingdom of the Medes, Darius the Mede. And we see that in Isaiah 13, where we see first it's a day of the wrath, but secondly, it, has a his, it had a historical fulfillment as well. I will stir up the Medes against them. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces. They shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And again, Sodom and Gomorrah is also a symbol of the last day. But they have a historical fulfillment, but they're also symbolic of the last day. And that's what we find in Isaiah 13 and 14. It's a symbol for the last day. We also see an important parallel passage to Isaiah 13 in Jeremiah 25. And Jeremiah 25 is a quite famous section of scripture about the 70 year captivity of Judah, the Babylonian captivity. And we see in Jeremiah 25, 11, the whole land, the whole land of Judah, which includes Jerusalem, shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. The king of Babylon had his heyday for 70 years. And it was a king, his son, and his grandson. 
over the course of 70 years, which we're going to look at in the next slide. But when those 70 years are accomplished, God says, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation for their iniquity and will make it perpetual desolations, a symbol of the last day, a symbol of judgment day. And that's what it's a par the Babylonian captivity is a parallel. The Babylonian captivity is, is the great tribulation. And then the judgment on Babylon is a symbol for the last day. Okay, so with that as a background, Isaiah 14, where Isaiah 13 focused on the judgment on Babylon, Isaiah 14 looks more in detail on the king of Babylon, the judgment on the king of Babylon. And again, the king of Babylon in the 6th century the, during the Babylonian captivity was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. But it also, during the seven-year period, it was his son and his grandson. We see that in Jeremiah 27, 7, all nations shall serve him. And Babylon not only conquered Israel and Judah, but also beyond that, other nations. He was the, the golden head, Daniel 2, which we're going to look at in the next video. But all nations shall serve him, his son and his son's son until the very time of that land, of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves on him. And that's symbolic language talking about judgment on Babylon. Judgment on Babylon. And his son's son is, a, the king was Belshazzar. And we see Belshazzar in Daniel 5, a very famous portion of prophecy about the handwriting on the wall. That was the fall of the Babylonian empire. By the Medes. We we read in Daniel 5, then was that part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, aparsin. But this is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and found are wanton, and that's directed at Belshazzar, this, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. You were found wanton. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And the Medes are the ones that actually invaded Babylon and took over Babylon. Okay, so now let's look at the characteristics of the king of Babylon that we find in Isaiah 14. And that helps us understand prophecy because it's another uh, type of the Antichrist. So we can understand the nature, the character, the actions of the Antichrist. And sure enough, we, we find harmony with other things we studied about the Antichrist. Isaiah 14, 11, thy pomp is brought down to the grave. And this is directed in the historical sense to the, to the king of Babylon. But, but his pomp, that word pomp in the Hebrew, literally means pride. And of course, that we see the pride in other descriptions of the Antichrist, which we're going to look at shortly. Isaiah 14, 13 and 14, You have said in thine heart, I will send into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I'll be like the Most High. Parallel passages of his pride, just like we saw in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Just like we see elsewhere in prophetic passages about the Antichrist. In the context, of course, this points to the 6th century king of Babylon. Because verses 16 and 17 say, is this the man that made the earth to tremble? Is this the, the, the king Belshazzar? The, the, the king of Babylon, that man that we knew, that did shake kingdoms? That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? So in, it points to a man, it pointed to the historical king of Babylon, but it also has a grander meaning It's because it's pointing to the Antichrist, which of course is powered by Satan. Second Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away, and that man of sin. It's a parallel passage of Isaiah 14, 16, The man that made the earth to tremble. That man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. Perdition means destruction. He destroyed the cities. They're parallel passages. And again, this is a type of the Antichrist in his pride. And we always have to remember that the Antichrist is powered by Satan. He's indwelled and he's powered by Satan, Revelation 13, 2. So it's important because some people see Isaiah 14 as just looking at Satan. 
Well, in a way it does because Satan's the one that's powering the Antichrist. But that but primarily it's focused on the Antichrist. And here are other passages about the pride of the Antichrist. They're very similar wording that what we find in Isaiah 14. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the man of sin, he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Similar language to what we saw in Isaiah 14. Daniel 8, this is the little horn of Daniel 8, another symbol for the Antichrist. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. The prince of the host is none other than Jesus Christ. He makes himself like Christ because he's an Antichrist. He's opposed to Christ. So that makes sense. He's opposed to the prince of the host, which is Christ. Daniel 11, this is the king of the north, another type of the Antichrist. The king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself, there's the pride, magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. He's arrogant. He's prideful. He thinks he's better than God. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. All of these are parallel passages to Isaiah 14 because they all are pointing to the same Antichrist that comes in that little season before the end day. And there's more than this. There's the leopard beast, which both symbols, the leopard beast and the prince of Tyre, both symbols of the Antichrist. Very similar language in those passages as well. Okay, so let's move on to another feature or another uh, characteristic of the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14, and that's oppression, to oppress people and to, to bring them under his thumb and to, to, to hurt them and to control them and to make war with them. And again, there's many passages that we can look at of the other symbols for the Antichrist that are parallel, but we see in Isaiah 14, he's an oppressor. He smote, and just imagine the king of Babylon becoming a world empire back in the 6th century BC. He's an oppressor. He smote people in wrath with a continual stroke. He ruled the nations in anger. One description is that he's a feller of trees. In other words, he cuts down trees. And I, I believe that's symbolic because God's people are often symbolized as trees. In particular, the Antichrist wants to persecute God's people. He wants to silence them. He wants to shove them off to the side, get rid of them. <clears throat> he weakens the nations. He makes the earth to tremble. He shakes the nations. He makes the world a wilderness and destroys cities. And Isaiah 14, 20, he destroyed the land and slain the people. He's all about oppression. And when we look at other Antichrist passages, we see, and there's many that we could put here, but these are just some examples. Daniel 9, the prince that shall come. That's another uh, symbol for the Antichrist. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that's pointing to Jerusalem and the holy place, which is where God's people are, which is the, 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 the church, the, the temple, just like the Antichrist sits in the temple. And the end there shall be with a flood, and to the end war desolations are determined. It's a war on God and his people. And that's what we see many other places. Revelation 13, 2, his feet were the feet of the bear, his mouth is the mouth of a lion. A bear is a very powerful angle animal. The feet point to subjection under the feet of the bear. And the mouth of a lion is devouring, destroying, eating. And that's, that's another symbol for the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 7, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all tribes, tongues, and nations. That's how the Antichrist will be during the Great Tribulation. He'll be a world leader, but also with a special focus on the persecution of God's people. And that's what we saw the little horn of the Daniel 7, Daniel 8, King of the North, Revelation 13, the leper beast. They all have the same things to say. Daniel 8, the little horn there. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, because he's powered by Satan. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. He destroys, he controls the world, but he also has a special focus on the church of God. It's important to note a very famous passage is Isaiah 14, 12, where in the context, 
it's the king of Babylon. And the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Now, in the historical context, this is pointing to, to the king of Babylon that's being discussed. But we recognize that being fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, and being cut down to the ground, it's talking about Satan. It's talking about Satan. So this king of Babylon is not only a, a type of the Antichrist, but is also a type of Satan. Because Satan actually indwells the Antichrist and powers the Antichrist during that little season. It's when Satan is loose from his prison during the Great Tribulation, and he indwells and he powers the Antichrist. We see clearly Luke 10, 18, he said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from the heaven. Fall from heaven. Same parallel passage of Isaiah 14, 12. Revelation 12, 9, the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of heaven. That old serpent that, that deceives the whole world, the devil and Satan, he was cast out into the earth. And literally mean that's the, the land or the ground. He was cut down to the ground. And his angels are cast out with him. And we're going to see, though, that, that Satan, Lucifer, is literally means brightness. And we know that Satan and his ministers come as angels of light, and that includes the Antichrist. So we find that the Antichrist is a type of Satan. And it's a type of Satan because he's referred to the, as, both are referred to as the king of Babylon. But we know that Satan indwells the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 2, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. That's his type of the Antichrist. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. The Satan powers the Antichrist. Uh, Daniel 8, his power, this is talking about the little horn, which is the Antichrist, shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Because he's powered by Satan. Satan indwells him. Satan powers him. He has Satan's power, seat, and great authority. Because this is the great tribulation. It's the loosing of Satan. He's gotten the power to go and deceive. And we see that indwelling somebody is not a surprise. Because the devil or Satan indwelled Judas Iscariot. Supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Judas Iscariot is also a type of the Antichrist. He was also opposed, opposed Antichrist, opposed to Jesus as the Christ. John 13, 27, after the sop, Satan entered into him. This is Judas Iscariot. Then said Jesus, and said, what you do, do quickly. So we see in Isaiah 14, this idea about Lucifer fits the context perfectly because it's pointing to that the real source of the king of Babylon as a type of the Antichrist is Satan. Okay, and we see though that Lucifer, because it points to brightness, it points to, it looks like an angel of light. It's, it's reminding us how Lucifer, Satan, which is also a trait of the Antichrist because Satan powers and indwells the Antichrist. It's about deception. Going back to 2 Corinthians 11, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. This Antichrist is going to look good. It's going to be like, oh, isn't this a good person? Isn't this somebody that's bringing light to the world? Therefore, it is of no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. This Antichrist, the man of sin, the king of Babylon, powered by Satan, Lucifer, will actually take his seat in the temple of God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Galatians 1.8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. There's people that come to us with gospels that are not true. It's the gospel of good works. It's the gospel of free will. It's the gospel of making a decision for Christ. It's a gospel of you need to be baptized. It's a gospel of you need to keep the Sunday as a Sabbath or the Saturday as a Sabbath. You need to do something for salvation. You need to go do good works first. You need to attend church faithfully or you're not a Christian. You need to join a church. 
The only thing that matters in salvation is whether God's chosen us and has given, given us the faith of Christ. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. That's how Lucifer, that's how the king of Babylon, they're subtle, they're, they're, they're deceivers, they look good, but on the inside they're powered by Satan. Just so, take a look at a couple of other Antichrist passages on deception. Second those, that's only chapter 2, which is the man of sin, which is a type of the Antichrist. He comes after the working of Satan because he's indwelt by Satan, Lucifer, with all power, signs, and lion wonders. And even today we see the increase of the signs and wonders movement continues. The charismatic and Pentecostal movements. Next verse, deceivableness of unrighteousness. It's okay to sin. That's deception. That's not true. In them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. There's no more love of the Bible. It's not respected. This cause God sends a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They're going to believe the Antichrist. They're going to believe the Babylonian doctrine of spiritual fornication and deception and all of that. That they all may be damned to believe not the truth, but they actually had pleasure in unrighteousness, in sin. Another passage, the little horn in Daniel 8.25, similar through his policy. Also, he shall cause craft to prosper. That word craft there means deception. He causes deception to prosper. And by peace, he shall destroy many. Peace, peace, when there's no peace. It's a false salvation plan. Make a decision for Christ. Keep the sacraments. Get baptized to be saved. Go to church on Sunday to be saved. Do all these things to be saved. You're okay. I'm okay. We're all okay as long as we come to church. And that's wrong. It's deception. He shall speak great words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And think to change times and laws. Change in making radical changes. Change in the truth of the Bible. Okay, one last important thought about the King of Babylon. That is to look at Babylon of Revelation 17 and 18. We've done a whole series on this. I'll tag this slide with that series. Please consider looking at those videos. Remember, Babylon rides the Scarlet Beast. The seventh head, the final head of the beast, is the Antichrist. We've looked at that in previous videos. It's in the Babylon video series. So the Antichrist not only is a world leader, but he also takes a seat in the church, which is Babylon. Babylon are the false churches. It's parachurches, which are unbiblical. The actions are fornication, which is the worship of other gods and idols. Materialism, worldliness, the abomination of desolation. She's a queen, a great city. She lives luxuriously. Has all the benefits of, of material wealth, etc. The merchants, she has merchants that use Christianity for gain. They go by land and by sea and they make proselytes, and it, but it's all about making riches for Babylon. The blood of Babylon points to the persecution of God's people, God's prophets. Sorcery of deception, she uses music, she uses the craftsmen that build false churches and false parachurches. There, there's craftsmen, there's tech, talented people, and again, the merchants are all about false teaching, deception, use of Christianity for gain. Okay, just a quick summary. The king of Babylon, it's a type of the Antichrist indwelled by Satan, Lucifer. Babylonian captivity is a symbol for the Great Tribulation. There's a whole bunch of information on this in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Isaiah 14, a primary description of the king of Babylon, focuses around pride, oppression, and deception, which is similar to other descriptions we see about other title symbols and types of the Antichrist in throughout the Bible. We're going to look next in Daniel 2. There's a great image given to the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, which is the king of Babylon. We're going to look at that. It's an important prophetic lesson for us. Please consider subscribing to this channel, and thank you very much for watching this video.